Hello and welcome to another edition of Shaka Extra Time. I am Paul Ndiho and uh, joining me on set is uh, Shaka Sali himself, a.k.a. the Kabale Kid. Uh, hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. How are you? Usually terrific. Uh, well, we have another great uh, week uh, ahead of us, uh, but uh, we'll start uh, with uh, exciting uh, news uh, from Africa. Uh, but uh, before we start, uh, let's uh, talk about, uh, uh, let me maybe take this opportunity to welcome you all, our Facebook followers are watching us uh, live from all over the world. Uh, Shaka Extra Time is a place where you get to talk to Shaka himself. Uh, Shaka, uh, let's uh, go to Angola for the first time maybe in a long time. We haven't talked uh, about Angola. Uh, but there's something interesting, uh, something happening in Angola. The new kid on the block, the president uh, of Angola, is beginning to crack his whip, uh, taking out uh, literally uh, all those guys who are uh, part uh, of the old regime. Uh, your thoughts? It's a very, very high time. And uh, to be honest with you, it is interesting that uh, President Orenko is making things happen. He's moved away from these other leaders who basically talk the talk without walking the talk. This man right now, as we talk, he's hardly in power for one year, remember? He came into office, I think, if I remember correctly, back in September of last year. He's not yet a year in office, but you can imagine how much he has accomplished in terms of fighting corruption. But is it sustainable? A lot of uh, critics would argue that uh, he's been part of the system that actually brought him into power. Uh, if you're looking for anybody who is corrupt, uh, he's arguably one of those people. To be very honest with you, I have not seen anything that uh, connects him with that type of behavior. Um, that is not to say that uh, he may not be part of it. Obviously, he was part of the system. But I think the fact that uh, he is able to do what he's doing right now he must be having what they call moral authority. And in fact, it is something that uh, had to be done, in fact, yesterday. Because let's face it, Angola is incredibly rich. But very, very few people are rich. And those, in fact, we are connected to the past president or the former president, President Jose Eduardo dos Santos. He was a very rich man. He was in the power for 38 years, mind you. Uh, he succeeded uh, a man called uh, Dr. Agostino Neto, a man who died back in 1979. Um, his son, a uh, very rich man, he used to be controlling a very a multi-billion dollar uh, foundation. And you know that uh, he has actually been indicted also for having siphoned away um, more than like um, actually half a billion US dollars to banks in the United Kingdom. Then you have his daughter, who has the distinction of being the richest female in Africa. And yet, the question is, how did she, in fact, earn that money? She used to be, by the way, the boss of Sonongor, the state oil industry. That's where most of the money in Angola come from. Mm -hmm. Until, of course, she was fired by the incumbent president. This man knows what he's doing. And the fact that he is even able to fire the army chief of staff, who apparently was trying to figure out a way of getting a credit line of 50 billion US dollars. Can you imagine? He also fired the chief of foreign intelligence. This man must know what he's doing. Let's face it. Until he became president, he was minister of defense. He's also a general in his own right. He is a former freedom fighter, or at least a liberation fighter. You know, when the MPLA, you know, uh, seized the power back in 1975. This is a man who also, just like his predecessor, studied in what was then the Soviet Union. And he got himself a degree in what they call historical sciences to boot in the Soviet Union. He is formidable. He seems to be on the right track. Uh, how about uh, those uh, critics uh, who say that uh, maybe perhaps uh, he's uh, doing this, uh, there's uh, everything he's trying to hide, and uh, most of the targets are politically motivated? Forget about that, because let's face it, um, I am not one of those people who is going to come and say, I know for sure that uh, the Angolan judiciary is an independent uh, arm of government and uh, that uh, it is obviously incorruptible. I don't know that. 
But let's face it, this information is coming out of the Angolan judiciary. These are the courts which are actually trying to do their job. And let's face it, what is the reaction so far? People, in fact, are urging him to go on. So I think this man knows exactly what he's doing. He also knows that uh, it is the right thing to do because, as I said, Angola is one of the richest countries in terms of resources. But in terms of distribution, you will find hundreds of thousands of people, my brother, sleeping on the streets of Rwanda, the capital. And what have you? Come on, man. Angola, the Rwandan capital, for example, Rwanda, happens to be one of the most expensive neighborhoods to live in. Mm. And yet people don't have the money. It's only very few people who have money. Uh, let's move along. Uh, let's uh, cross over to uh, Malawi. Uh, former President uh, Joyce Banda, uh, uh, there are reports that uh, she's going back uh, to her country uh, nearly four years after she's been in self-imposed uh, exile. Uh, your thoughts? Well, I think it is high time she went back, really. You know, of course, that uh, she, uh, uh, it was alleged that uh, she was involved in cash get, uh, a very uh, obviously unfortunate, you know, kind of, you know, event that took place um, in, in Malawi when she was in office. Uh, but in fact, the facts will show that uh, she inherited this cash get from the president that she succeeded who actually died, uh, Dr. Bingu Wamuzarika. And uh, yes, there were some very high officials in her cabinet. Uh, they were, in fact, uh, some of them found guilty, and they are serving time for that. And recently, I, I saw that uh, the, Angola, you know, the Malawian courts found that there was no evidence. There was no evidence uh, to nail uh, Joyce Banda. So I think she's very free to go back to her country. And um, perhaps uh, since there's going to be an election very soon, uh, present herself and see if she can have a shot at State House again. Who knows? Uh, Shaka, I was in uh, Malawi right after uh, the elections uh, took uh, place uh, nearly uh, almost uh, five years ago. And uh, Joyce Banda, uh, at the time, wa had just uh, lost uh, those uh, elections. And to be honest with you, I spoke to a lot of people on the ground, young people, old people, and nobody seemed to, to like her for some reason. They didn't think that she measured up to, to, the, to, to, to the level of uh, leading that country, that she was not a strong leader. Are you suggesting that uh, you sort of carried out uh something equivalent perhaps to uh, a public opinion survey? Uh, not necessarily, but uh, from uh, just uh, observing and talking to people, uh, and I'm not talking about politicians. I went to the markets, I went to universities, talked to young people, and uh, that's the impression I got. Well, you know, when you are in power, there are always going to be those people that support you. Some of them, in fact, psychophants, because obviously uh, they have something to benefit from you. And uh, there are also going to be other people that are not going to be, you know, to particularly like you. Um, let's face it, uh, she also happens to be a female. How many female have you known who have actually occupied that position in Africa? In addition to Joyce Banda, we have only seen one, Ellen Johnson Sarif in Liberia. And you know, you come from Africa, where I also happen to come from. Uh, you know the stereotype about uh, women leaders and all that kind of stuff. So. I wouldn't be surprised, frankly, that uh, some people may not even have the evidence. Uh, they may not even care about whether, in fact, she did a terrific job and what have you. But the fact that she was a woman, uh, they probably feel that uh, she was, in fact, doing some kind of interfering, uh, becoming the owner or in charge of state house, rather than perhaps being where a lot of other people, unfortunately, they say, a woman belongs to the kitchen. Uh, interesting. Uh, you've had an opportunity to interview her yes. uh, on a number of uh, occasions. Uh, what does she bring to the table? Remarkably articulate. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you were around when uh, were you around when uh, I actually had the Horn Street Talk Africa. Yes. Oh, come on, man. I mean, let's face it. Uh, this is someone that knows what she's doing. She may not be the best, you know, uh, if you compare her with some other people and what have you. But let's face it. Uh, she was able uh, to articulate uh, whatever kind of uh, vision that she had. Um, only that, of course, let's face it, uh, she was in power 
for about two years. So she didn't even have a one full term mm. uh, in order for her, frankly, uh, to put some of the ideas that she had into practice. And so I think she deserves really the benefit of the doubt. Uh, let's move uh, across uh, to uh, Southern Africa. Uh, there's some exciting news about uh, former President uh, Jacob Zuma. Uh, the buzz is that uh, he's just found himself a new wife, a 24-year-old. Uh, what a remarkable gentleman. And I, that I think is, of he has, course, uh, uh, wife number five? I, I, I cannot count. I, I stopped counting some time back. But you know, that is a very interesting neighborhood because, let's face it, uh, you know the king of Swaziland, who apparently has since uh, changed the name, um, he probably has, uh, you know, you're talking about double digits. Now, in fairness to Jacob Ozuma, you have to, first of all, um, accept the fact that uh, uh, he's entitled to his constitutional and democratic rights. Because let's face it, uh, the last time I checked, when you look at uh, the very progressive constitution, by the way, of South Africa, mm -hmm. probably the best on the continent and probably one of the best in the world, to be honest with you. Um, both the constitution of the Republic of South Africa and the culture of the Zulu people where uh, Mr. Zuma Mushorozi hails from, uh, allow for you uh, to have as many spouses as you can afford. So he's not really committing any crime here. Yes, he's a 76-year-old man. Yes, mm. this young lady is a 24-year-old uh, lady. Or but enough to it. be his granddaughter. Yes, but yeah. let's face it. Uh, these two individuals are adults, and these two individuals are essentially asserting their constitutional rights. I am told that uh, this lady uh, began seeing uh, Mr. Zuma when she was 19. And so, frankly, we are not talking about something here and uh, the age and all that kind of stuff. There, there are no crimes If it was here. here, that would be defilement, right? I don't think it would be defilement because uh, if you are 18 in this country, you are an adult. But you are looking adult. at the age of uh, Yeah, seven. but you, allow, you can get married. You can get married. And let's face it, uh, uh, South Africa has even also other aspects that are probably different from a lot of African countries. In South Africa, for example, they have what you would call proportional representation. In South Africa, unlike most countries, you do not vote specifically for an individual for member of parliament. You actually vote for a political party. And each party, if it gets 5%, I think, if I remember correctly, then it is entitled to representation in parliament. And the party has the right to choose the specific individual that serves into that office. Mm. In South Africa, you do not have a presidential system where somebody goes throughout the country campaigning to be the next president. It is the party or the coalition of parties, if they win to go into parliament, they are the ones, in fact, that eventually elect or choose somebody to be president. So there are differences here. And I think, really, there are a lot of things that a lot of African countries, sincerely, uh, need to kind of like borrow from South Africa. Because let's face it, we've talked about how South Africa is one of the few countries on the continent that is able, for example, to recall a president, or anybody for that matter. Mm. And we have agreed that, let's face it, at least for now, it has demonstrated that it is the beacon of hope for African democracy so far. Uh, le you are watching uh, Shaka Extra Time, and uh, uh, Shaka, let's go back to maybe something uh, very controversial that is also happening uh, on the continent, uh, the River Nile. A lot of, uh, uh, this is a river that uh, uh, arguably starts uh, in Uganda and goes all the way to Egypt, uh, but uh, there are, there's a lot of controversy surrounding uh, who owns the water that actually, uh, the, uh, some people call it the lifeblood of uh, most of these uh, countries. Uh, so let's talk about that. It's a good poll that uh, you say arguably uh, originates from Uganda. And here you are talking, in fact, about the White Nile. 
You're not talking about the Blue Nile. The Blue Nile originates from Ethiopia. But even the White Nile... River the, Nile, the, White Nile, then Blue Nile. Well, White mm. Nile, mm. Blue Nile, they, are bo they both form what is called the Nile River. Mm. But the thing is, the question even about the source. Uh, you know, Speck, uh, you know, um, allegedly discovered the source of the Nile in a ginger, where you and I actually had some, you know, uh, called home for some time. And yet, let's face it, first of all, there's no way Speck could have discovered the source of the Nile because he was not the first individual. There were local people. Precisely. <laughs> the other thing is that uh, when you go to Ujumbura, you go to Rwanda, in fact, they have a hotel called Source de Nile, the source of the Nile. They actually claim to be the authentic or the original source of the White Nile. When you go to Rwanda, you have the same thing. The Congolese, you know, all that kind of stuff. So really, we don't actually know uh, the authentic origin of the White Nile. But having said that, it is very, very interesting that uh, there have been about four agreements about how the now 10 countries could actually figure out a way of sharing that resource. But the most important agreement is the one, guess what, which was signed in 19, 1929 between Egypt and what was then called Great Britain. And Great Britain was signing that agreement on behalf of some of the colonies and protector, protectorates mm. and the territories that were under her, you know, colonial leadership. So we're talking about Kenya. We're talking about then, Kenya was a settler colony. It was, in fact, never supposed to be really independent under Africans. Mm. It was a settler colony. And then you have uh, south of Kenya, there was a country called Tanganyika. It was a territory, now Tanzania, uh, having Tanganyika and Zanzibar being, you know, being coming together in 1964. You come, you, be, you have Tanzania. Then you had Uganda. These were the countries that uh, had actually been, uh, uh, you know, were part of the agreement of 1929. But guess what? This agreement provides a veto power to Egypt. Even though it does not, in fact, the, these, these waters do not originate from there. Mm. But it has veto powers. And it has even threatened to go to war. In fact, it has with, threatened to uh, go to war with Ethiopia yes. because Ethiopia is doing something that the Egyptians do not think was actually in their interest because they are building uh, some kind of uh, huge, huge renaissance uh, dam which would be providing electricity and what have you in that region. And uh, let's face it, uh, by the way, the Blue Nile actually has more waters that pour into the Nile mm. than the White Nile, because the White and Blue Nile actually meet in the Sudan before they move on to Egypt and the Mediterranean. So it is a very unfair agreement, just like back in 1884, the Berlin Conference under uh, Chancellor Bismarck, which brought about what history regards to as the scramble for Africa, mm. where European powers actually sat around a huge table mm. with not a single African present. But guess what? The Africans are actually trying to fit into those boundaries. Yeah, that's a good uh, segue. Let's go to our Facebook uh, comments, Sashaka. Uh, uh, there is a, a, a Facebook uh, uh, from uh, Nigeria here who says, Emily Okoli says, as a Nigerian living in Nigeria, who those saying that uh, Mr. Buhari is incorruptible is purely a fallacy. Buhari is not only corrupt, but nepotistic and uh, incapable. What's your take, Shaka? Well, I think that uh, my brother is entitled to his opinion, but uh, from where I am, and uh, the kind of research or homework that I have done. Uh, to be honest with you, I have uh, gone all over the place. I have not found the kind of evidence uh, that this gentleman is uh, sort of uh, quoting in terms of uh, Buhari being corrupt. Um, I don't know about being nepotistic. Uh, he probably has more information about that than I do. 
but I think most reasonable people so far, when they look at um, past Nigerian leaders, they will say that this man, who was a major general, uh, who was catapulted into power back in nine, first in 1985 by a coup led by General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida and Sani Abacha. These guys, after two years, they had to overthrow Buhari precisely because he was actually fighting or trying to fight against corruption. And these guys happened to be like not only commander in chief of their armies, but they were also like commander in chief of corruption. Uh, let's go to another Facebook uh, comment uh, from uh, uh, Ayub Khan. Uh, he, he lives in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. He writes, uh, President Paul Bia of Cameroon and President Ayorim Seveni of Uganda have no more vision for their nations. Uh, your take? Well, I don't know whether they have or they do not have the vision. Uh, all I can say is that uh, at least from the literature I know about both. Uh, they cannot claim to be Democrats because the manner in which they actually stay in office, it's not really through elections which or whose results are reflections of the voters, but rather it is a facade. Their election results are reflections of the people who they choose, personally choose, to count the elections and also to announce those elections. So these people are not even accountable to their people. They are probably accountable to the Treasury, which they use to bribe people and compromise others. And uh, also, they are accountable, maybe, to their armies, their security forces, the obvious institutions uh, that bring about violence, intimidation, and what have you, but not the people. I think there is a lot of evidence, a lot of copious evidence in terms of at least that context. But whether or not uh, they have run out of visions or whatever, I don't know, because let's face it, they have been in power for many, many years, each of them more than three decades. But frankly, when you look at uh, development and what have you, you don't see them, you know, you don't see their countries mentioned anywhere. And yet, we sometimes talk about um, a guy from Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, who was in power for 31 years, which is much less than each of them, uh, yet he has the results. Singapore was a poor third world country. By the time he left, after 31 years, Singapore is a, a major superpower. It is probably the largest financial center in the world. It also has one of the largest income per capita in the world. It is, in fact, in the League of Developed Nations. But when you go to Uganda, or you go to uh, Cameroon, you don't see anything, frankly, just because somebody has been in power for 32 years for Uganda, and I think about 36, 37 for uh, Cameroon. In fairness uh, to Uganda now, President Ayori Museveni, people can argue a lot of uh, his fans can, could argue that uh, he has brought stability. Uh, people actually use that to say that uh, they sleep at night. Uh, they use uh, economic and social development. Uh, you can talk about uh, the roads. There is infrastructure development. Uh, you can drive from one point to another. Uh, isn't that uh, fair? Uh, first, to of say all, about it, uh, first of all, if you are in a government, frankly, uh, that's what you are supposed to do. You are supposed to do something. But when you talk about stability and peace, what do you actually mean, or what do those people mean by stability and peace? Is it simply because somebody has been in the state house uninterrupted for so many years? Stability and peace, Paul, someone would argue that it is not the absence of war. It is not the absence of violence. Rather, it is the presence of social economic justice for all. Do those things obtain in those two countries that you have talked about? I, I think so. I think so. What do you mean you think so? Yeah. You, you know, you talk about social economic justice? Yes. How can you talk about social economic justice where you don't even have an election, you have selections? I, I, How can you talk I, I, about social economic justice where there is no service delivery or inadequate service delivery to the extent that even the president himself at one time demonstrated that he had absolutely no confidence in his own country 
to the extent that his daughter, who was supposed to give birth and not sick, was dispatched to Germany in a presidential jet just to give birth. Okay, real quickly, let's go to another uh, Facebook comment from, from uh, Kayola Mustafa. He wants your take on uh, how you distinguish African leaders from African rulers. Make it very brief. Very interesting, because, yeah. the, the, you know, the answer is very simple. If you are an African leader, it means that you are accountable to your people. And it also means that it is your people who have chosen you to be in office. So there is that kind of uh, dynamic. On the other hand, an African ruler is somebody who does not account his actions to his people, simply accounts his actions to the security forces that he commands and the treasury that he uses to bribe and compromise people. Uh, what are you talking about uh, tomorrow on Straight Talk Africa? Well, very interestingly, tomorrow, in fact, there is a, a special town hall edition, and uh, it is going to be looking at the issue of autism, and it is going actually to be moderated by the one and only Leno Modu, uh, someone that, of course, uh, has a lot of experience, uh, uh, has um, hosted a lot of health issues, and I think... Uh, I can't wait to see it myself. Uh, okay, we still have uh, time for maybe another question. Uh, let's go to another Facebook comment from uh, Cameroon. Let's go to Pius Takim uh, in Cameroon. Uh, he says, uh, the United Nations uh, has played a significant role in uh, helping nations that uh, really sometimes seek for help. Uh, why can't the United Nations go, go to their rescue in uh, Cameroon? Well, it depends what we are talking about. I'm sure that um, they have United Nations presence in the Cameroon. I'm sure they have the UNDP. I am sure that uh, they have offices of UNHCR. Uh, they have the offices of World Health Organization and what have you. And I'm sure these different offices are making a difference in the Cameroon one or the other. But if you are talking about uh, uh, bringing about democracy and uh, that kind of stuff, I don't see how democracy can come from the United Nations, because even the Security Council itself, which has five permanent members, only three countries, Britain, France, and the United States, can probably claim to have democracy, because when you talk about Russia and the China, they can't pretend to have a democracy. And guess what? They actually hold or wield veto power. Uh, in 30 seconds, uh, uh, is there a democracy in Tanzania, considering that the government is now forcing bloggers, uh, 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 vloggers uh, to, uh, to pay tax on uh, whatever they post online? I think that everything I have been seeing lately, uh, and uh, the new president, of course, uh, he's been there for quite some time right now, uh, John Pombe Magufuli, I would probably say that uh, Tanzania is democratically challenged as we talk. Yeah, well, on that note, I thank you so much. Uh, once again, Ashaka, it's an, always a pleasure having you here. Uh, it was a great uh, conversation. I look forward to hosting you on another edition of Ashaka Extra Time. The feeling uh, is mutual. Uh, until then, uh, so long uh, from uh, Washington.